good. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Eric. Yeah. Hi, who have we got there? Hi, this is Amy and Randy from Seattle. Hey, good morning and welcome. Hi, welcome to the shop. Thank you so much. Yeah, we've got a few other folks from Calgary and Edmonton online. So, uh, yeah, more the merrier. And I got an echo. I think I must be. Uh, I think it's coming from your microphone, or it's it's not a problem. It's just a little under. It just kind of caught me off guard. You just think you're stuttering, Bert. I guess so. Yeah. Well, the funny part is, is that there's that delay. Yeah. When I, I say something and then a second or a second later I can hear myself say it again. And it's like ooh, ooh. It's your inner <laughs> self talking back. Yeah. Anyway, so the folks from Seattle, that's uh Amy and uh who else you got with you, Amy? We have Randy with us. Okay, well welcome okay. to you both. Well, welcome to you both. And uh Thank I, you. Guess we, I guess we we were, we were talking about doing uh uh, wig stands, and you had some questions. I think you mentioned you'd seen the the demonstration that we did at the Edmonton Woodturners Guild a couple of years ago, and you had some questions about wig stands. Yes, that's correct. We're trying to mass produce them, and one of the the big question that I had was when you put either the headstock or I mean the, uh, the the wig top or the base flat up against your chuck without making a tenon and you hold it with a friction uh, yep. live center, how that works so mm -hmm. that we can uh, do the Morse taper. So that's really the part where we would like um, a little bit more detail on, but um, love to watch you go through the whole thing. And then we will share this with the other ladies in our women in training group and uh, start mass producing these. Okay, well, that's, that's great. Cause uh, uh, when I do my uh, uh, wig stands, I generally do uh, a whole bunch at a time. Like I'll, uh, I'll do a whole bunch of uh, spindles. Then I'll, I'll get a whole bunch of blanks for the tops and the bottoms. And I look at the wood before I get started and I write on on the edge of the the wood what it's going to be so that I, if I have a whole pile of these, I think the last time I made wig stands, I ended up making, I think, 16 in an afternoon. And you get all these piles of discs and stuff. I wrote on each one which one was the pair and what it was going to be because it helps mass producing. Do you have more people turning at the same time? We did a... Uh our wit group down here the women in turning we did a group where we had uh several lathes in a room at a time and we did some turning to understand how to do it then randy and i met at my house to try to get some good instructions written out uh that we could pass off to the group yep. and so that's what we're hoping to get from this uh would you mind since you're recording this would you mind sending it to me um sometime I when you're done with it I can. I'm gonna. I've got it recording on Zoom, so I'll, I'll probably uh, pull it down and edit it a little bit because I've had the recording running a bit, but uh, shorten it up a little. Sure, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, what I can do is, I, uh, when I set this stuff up to do it, I usually do all of the spindles first. So if I have um, eight or ten spindles, and I don't do the full spindle every time, I, I do the uh, the tenon on both ends <clears throat> and I'll do that on a bunch of spindles and then I'll take the pieces that are going to be the bases and I'll do that friction hold and I do all of those on, on one side so I do each one as a step which is handy if you've got two people turning in the same room if I'm doing sp the spindles and I'm pretty good at doing the uh, the tenon fits well then I can go ahead and do all the tenon fits take the piece off hand it to somebody else to go and do the rest of the the design on the spindle because not everybody gets comfortable doing tenon fits. So I do a tenon fit and I'll fit it to whatever size hole I'm gonna do. And I just do all of the tenons um, at one time. So if I had uh, if I got a couple of blanks here, I'll do both, both of the blanks at the same time on both ends. Then my muscle memory for doing tenons is pretty good. And then when I switch to another uh, part of the process, then my muscle memory, I, I can forget about being accurate on tenons, and I can just freehand the rest of the uh, 
the uh, spindle and make whatever changes I want with it. Or somebody else can take the spindle and, and, and do that part of it. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Uh, okay. So I guess without further ado, I'll just uh, I'll just go ahead and start making a, a wake stand. And uh, Ted's going to moderate over there because I can't see my computer. So if any questions or whatever, just uh, yell at Ted, and then uh, he can he can yell at me. I can hear you guys, and uh, we'll go from there. What kind of I wonder if I should bird maple. Uh, this one's maple, and this one's going to be oak. Oh yeah, okay. And uh, yeah, I'll well, I'll just go ahead and um, undo the spindle ends first, and then we'll move right up to the uh, to the other round pieces. I'll grab my face shield. And uh, I'm just turning this around. And uh, as per usual, I already, um, uh, I, I didn't really screw up, but I just changed the, the process. I normally do, I normally do the tenon on the tailstock end because my live center is uh, smaller. Let's see, my, my live center is a little smaller than the, uh, uh, let's get this here. Than the tenon, so the the live center is three quarter inch, and I use a three quarter inch tenon. This particular drive is uh, seven eighths, so if I get too close to it, I'll touch steel. But here, I the end of my live center is a little smaller than three quarter, and I use a three quarter inch wrench as a sizing mechanism. And I'm using a three-quarter inch skew so that I know that I can get a three-quarter inch long tenon. Hey Bert, did you um, sharpen that crescent wrench particularly so that you could do that? Say again. Say again. Did you sharpen that crescent wrench so that you could throw it on the tenon like that? Yes, I did. I yeah, sharpened. I sharpened, uh, I sharpened uh, let's see, where's the best camera? Yeah, I, I sharpened, uh, sharpened uh, one uh, one end of it, one end of and it. this part I just kind of rounded over and left round. So when I put it on the wood, on the wood this, rounded portion, this rounded portion, it just kind of re rests, kind of on, rests the on the wood. And when you push forward, you push forward the cutting edge the cuts cutting it. Edge cuts it. Oh, cool. Very and clever, because, thank you. And because a wrench isn't exactly three quarters of an inch, it's usually a little bigger. So I touch it with a skew after I'm done, and then I fit it into a three quarter hole. Now that's just a little bit too tight. So we'll just uh, take it down just ever so slightly. Well, it spilled a little bit tight. Once I do two or three of these, the next ones would get uh, a lot cl closer, a lot quicker.
basically what I'm doing right now is just because it's the first one of the day, I'm getting my muscle memory. There, that's perfect. Room for glue, but it's a, it's a good fit. So then I swap it around and I'll do the other end. How much room are you leaving for glue? Just a little tight. Amy was asking how much room you're leaving for glue, Bert. Uh, it's, a, it's a slip fit. If you have to push it in, it's too tight. And it's uh, three quarters of an inch uh, tenon. And I usually, when I drill the hole, I drill the hole an inch. So there's an eighth of an inch on the bottom of the hole for pushing glue into so it doesn't hydraulic. But I try and make this fit a slip fit. There's, uh, glue doesn't take up much room on the sides. Thank you. And if the fit was uh, really, really too loose, there, that's that'll go in. That one will go in. It's a little bit tighter than I normally do. But it would still work. And if you're doing, when I'm doing eight or 10 of them, I would probably call that good because I can put a little bit of glue on there and slam it in. There, I just, uh, it goes in a little easier once it's been pushed in there once. So that, that's kind of the fit. It's not tight, but it's not loose. And if you make it a little bit too loose, uh, just use epoxy instead of glue because the epoxy will fill a void. You just have to make sure that it's straight. But what I normally do then when I'm making a set of wig stands, I would make a whole bunch that look like this. And then my muscle memory, then I don't have to worry about fitting anything when I go to shape the uh, the body of the spindle. I don't have to worry about the ends anymore. I just kind of round this over and do whatever I want for a, a detail. And I'll do eight or 10 of these before I go to the next step. So if you've got two people in a shop, one person's making these, once he gets one or two ahead, the next person can start doing the what you know the shaping and your and your uh, mass production can increase dramatically. Less wasted effort. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, okay. you probably all know how to turn a spindle, so I won't worry about uh, turning a spindle on that one. I'll do it later. We'll uh, move right on to the, uh, let's see, I'll set this back. Put this back to here so it's looking at the at the headstock and the friction drive you're wanting to see. So uh, right now I'm using um, a talon chuck with uh, number three jaws. It's just a little little bigger than the than the standard jaws, but you could use it with standard jaws as well. And uh, I usually have the jaws open about the uh, uh, eighth of an inch or whatever, so it's like a perfect circle. And uh, what I used to do is drill the blank, use a woodworm screw with a spacer. So the woodworm screw would be in the chuck and it'd have a spacer and you'd have these threads out here. But what I found after doing seven or eight of these in a row, my um, little bit of arthritis coming on, I was having trouble taking these things off. To unscrew them so I had to figure out a way that was a little easier so I don't drill mine anymore I just use this friction fit and this is the side that's going to have the uh, uh, the, uh, the spindle in so it's going to have the hole so I wrote on this one bottom of the wig head but on the top of the 
um, wig head. I need to put an external tenon so that I can grab it with a chuck to finish this side. And because I've already got a center hole on here, I line it up with the uh, the center mark of the of the wood, lock my tailstock, and I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but this the point the point of the uh, the point of the uh, tail center goes into the wood about an eighth of an inch. So to me, that's a piece of steel in the wood that's jammed up. And on this side, it's friction fit against the uh, spindle. So in order for this thing to come out sideways, it would have to rip that one eighth piece of uh, wood full, the full length. So I don't normally uh, turn the outside of this with a friction fit because if you have a catch, it can it can slip and go around. And I just don't, I don't um, trust the, the hold. But because this is the top of the wig head and uh, we need to finish the bottom, I put a tenon on this side because it's going to get turned away anyhow. And uh, I marked uh, uh, one, yeah, I marked the uh, I marked the size of the tenon with a compass just so you can see what I uh, what I'm doing here. But normally I don't put the pencil mark on for myself. I run it up against the the chuck, and then when I use my recess tool, I can look down here and see where the chuck is, and I just make sure the recess is big enough for the chuck, or the tenon is big enough for the chuck. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I thought you were turning the outside of the bowl, and I couldn't understand how that would hold it. So, yes, that makes perfect sense. Okay. Yeah. So this is okay. this, is the, this is the wig head, and uh, once you turn the head, this is all going to be turned away like this. Like it's going to be the shape of the head. So if I put a tenon out here that I can grab, well, I can grab the tenon. And I know later when I finish the underside, um, I'll be able to uh, get rid of that tenon. And I've got, I've got uh, dovetail jaws, so I put a small dovetail tenon on it. So if I had a stack of these, I would go ahead and do this to the whole stack. All of the wig heads would get a tenon, so then I don't get mixed up. But for this one here, we'll just flip it around and uh, put it in the in the chuck, and we'll finish the bottom of the of the wig head. And the reason I would do the whole batch at the same time is because I already got my parting tool in my hand and it's just easier to just swap pieces out and put the ten all the tenons on. And then uh, when I change and do this next uh, step, I've got a bowl gouge in my hand so I can do the whole works on the, on the bowl gouge. And I don't need a tailstock for this part. And this is going to be the... Uh, um, the bottom of the wig head. <laughs> I got to keep myself lined up here and exactly what I'm doing. So I'm going to drill, drill the hole. So Bert, I'm using picture in picture is covering up a good part of what you're working on. Okay. So which one would work better, that one or this one? So now I'm putting in a three quarter inch hole. Uh, to do slow the speed down. And I've got it marked for depth with that piece of uh, piece of tape. I'm using um, a Forstner bit here, but most of the time I'll generally use a. Uh, just a spiral bit because the uh, personer bit has a, a very long point. 
and a regular conventional, just a drill bit, three quarter inch drill bit has a, just a tapered point. It isn't quite as uh, proud. So now just as a quick check, there's a three quarter inch hole in there. That's a little bit loose. It's, that one's a little bit loose, but that's fine. I would use epoxy on it. So that's the, uh, this is the bottom of the wig stand. So I'm gonna turn the outside around and then I'm gonna shape this and get ready to uh, reverse it uh, onto the chuck. So this is my recess tool. It's uh, just a scraper that has, let's see, which which camera we on? So it's just a scraper that's been uh, reshaped to have this little offset. And the main reason for the offset is when you're uh, working with a tailstock in place on a small recess, you'll see it on when I do the bases, I have to do the recess with the tailstock support on the friction drive and you can't get a regular tool in, but this one here allows you to get the uh, get the angle, gets the angle of the uh, dovetail. You just push it in and pull it, and you've got the uh, the perfect recess. You could do. Sorry, is that bottom totally? <clears throat> sorry, is that bottom totally flat? Here. Here. No, oh, on, on the, the tool. inside where you did the recess. Okay, on the tool here. So on the no, angle. On the on the wig stand, on the inside of the wig stand where the recess is? Yeah. yeah. No, is it that, flat or you're just resting uh, on that one edge? Uh, well, no, on the inside of the, the inside is hollow. And then I just took the, uh, let's see, can you see? Okay. So this is hollowed out like a bowl. So it's probably, uh, maybe a half inch thick uh, left or maybe three eighths. And then I just took my tool and come out on the on the rim and just put the recess on the outside of the rim. So it's like a bowl with um, a recess cut in the underside. Perfect, thank you. So then what I normally would do is go ahead and finish and sand and do everything I want to do on the bottom. This is all I'd even I can even apply finish if I wanted to, but I normally don't. I just I sand it to whatever finish that I want on the on the bottom, and basically the bottom is uh, is done. So then I turn around and uh, open this up on that recess. So now I've expanded my uh, my chuck into the recess. Oops, what am I doing here? I got too much sand in there. I'll have to uh, blow it out. Okay. 
Uh, normally I have my air compressor running so I can blow all the sawdust and sanding out of there. So no, that's that's held on the recess. And we go ahead and finish the uh, outside of the ball head. Or the wig head, rather. So you could you can uh, continue to shape this however you like and sand it to whatever finish you normally want to have. And basically, that uh, wig head stand or the wig head is uh, basically done. Now to do the base, and again, if I was doing this like I normally do, I would have a half a dozen blanks. So I would do that process a half a dozen times. So then. Uh, um, then all that many wig, wig stands would be uh, would be done. And now for the base. And for the base, I do the same thing. I do a friction hold. And I've got this written on here. This is going to be the bottom of the base. So I do this one a little bit differently than, uh, than the top because I want a way of uh, holding. I want a way of holding it so that I can finish the bottom. So when I use my tool on here to uh, cut the recess, I'll have to come back and uh, uh, take out the material inside of, um, in, inside of the recess. But in order to do that, I'll put a recess on this side and on the other side. And again, for uh, simplistically sake, I've already got the uh, pencil mark on here to let me know uh, how big of a recess that will fit these jaws. So that's how quick it is to put a recess in. And on this side, Now that I've got the recess in place, I basically have control of this uh, block or blank. And so right now, this is going to be the eventual uh, bottom end of the base, but I need a way to hold it so I can finish it. So I'm going to uh, put another recess on this side. And I made this recess a little bit bigger than the other one because this section in the center is part of a design element that I use. 
because on the finished wig stand, I like to hollow this out like a bowl for um, <clears throat> for bobby pins or earrings or whatever, what somebody might want to use. So now we're back at the bottom of the wig stand. I taper the bottom ever so slightly so that it always sits on the outside edge when it's sitting on a table. And these little uh, uh, details in here, those are wood turner details because any wood turner that's ever picked up my wig stands, they always flip it over and look at the bottom. So I give them something to look at. Basically, that portion of the uh, the bottom of this case is basically it, it, it's done. It's finished. I would sand it up to whatever uh, grit. I usually only go to uh, 220, sometimes sometimes 280 or three, uh, 320. But it's a wig stand, and I use Osmo, which is water and alcohol impervious. And it, with Osmo, they only recommend you sand to 150 grit. So going to 220 grit is fine and Osmo actually fills the pores and gives you a nice satin, smooth wood feeling uh, finish. It's a hard wax oil. And so that's what I use. Now here's the top of the, uh, the top of the base. I'm gonna drill it as well. I'll slow the lathe down. I always like to take the drill bit out when I'm not using it, which is why when I'm doing this, I would do uh, a half a dozen of them up to this point, and then I would drill them all at the same time so I don't have to... Uh, worry about banging my uh, elbow into the into the sharp drill bit. And as I said, this is the top of the base. So I like to put a bit of a bowl shape in here and I can uh, modify this a little bit just to uh, uh, get, like say, just give it some place to, to put things, earrings or rings or bobby pins or whatever.
And when I put this little bit of a groove on here, I like to slope this a little bit so it's not straight, like uh, it's not too steep. So if you got something in here, when you pick it up, you gotta, you can just kind of swipe it out. But uh, this has been sanded on both sides. And uh, basically this wig stand is done. Oh, that's good. So basically that's the week stand done, short of the, the spindle turning. So I would turn this, I usually use a kind of a candle, a little bit heavier on the bottom and taper it up and then I, um, and then call it good. This one's just a little bit loose. I would probably uh, use epoxy on this one. The top, it's not too bad. It fits pretty good. Glue would work on here. But if I was mixing epoxy to do one end on this particular one, I'd epoxy both of them. Any questions on that, Any so, questions far? On that so far? No, that was very informative. Thank you so much. We learned a couple extra trips along, uh, tricks along the way, too. <laughs> well, that's always the fun part is that there, there's a lot of different ways of doing things. And I, I learned from uh, a lot of people just some tricks. One thing I forgot. One thing I forgot to mention on these is uh, when I'm. It may not have been obvious, but when I was cleaning the face off, I always put an angle on this. Uh, I try and angle this in towards the hole, so that when I have a rounded face on here, it will always contact all the way around. If this was perfectly flat, it would give. It might give you a a, a, a sight line or a a gap. But if this is tapered in. Then as long as this is You're round, off. it'll always it'll always seat all the way around. You're off camera there, Bert. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we needed this one here. Oh, I I must have banged it. Let's see. Sorry about that. Yep. Can you see that now? Okay. Yeah. So uh, what I was saying is that I usually bevel this in towards the hole slightly. So that when this piece, where it's rounded over, mates up against here, if this was perfectly flat and this wasn't perfectly flat, you'd have a crack or you could see it. But if this is beveled in and this is undercut slightly so it's touching on the outside edge, every time you put it in, it'll be perfectly flat and square, especially if you're using epoxy because that's if it's a little bit loose, that's one way you can keep the spindle straight. And again, now that we've got the the spindles with the ends on them, if I was doing this, I I can change to my longer um, tool rest, and now I can go ahead and uh, and turn this around and shape it however I like to see it. So you've just got the left hand end of that spindle on camera, Bert. That's better?
Okay, there we go. One week's in. And like I was saying earlier, I would make each one of the pieces in a batch. So um, I'd normally make, you know, let's say eight or 10 spindles. Then I do eight or 10 bases. And then I do eight or 10 tops. And inside of a couple hours, I'd have wig stands ready for glue up. And again, the tools I used, uh, I used the uh, a wrench. I've sharpened it on one side. It makes it really, really quick to make a tenon. I use my uh, tenon or uh, recess tool. This thing saves me so much time because I can put a recess in in a matter of seconds. And then I have a really secure way of uh, holding the blank so I can do the next step. Like so I used to use the uh, woodworm screw, but then I'd have to drill the hole then I have to screw it onto here. Then I have to unscrew it and turn it around. It all works, but uh, doing it the, the method I'm using, uh, I feel for me, it works, it's safe. Because once I'm uh, compression fitted against the chuck and we've got the point of the tail center stuffed into the wood, I don't see where the wood can go anywhere. And I only hold it that way long enough to put a recess, to put the recess in which is a very, very small, small cut. And then once I have it on the recess, I have total control on with the chuck. Uh, that's, that's the main reason I do the process the way I, the way I've developed the process, I, uh, it's been a evolution and uh, this is what's been working for me. Any questions? So do you go by the uh, finished size of 13 to 15 inches, or do you ever make any smaller one for uh, maybe a shorter wig, a man, a child? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. The, the, the length of the spindle is totally arbitrary. Uh, some of them I've made really short, and we call them hat stands. So they work for a hat stand or a wig stand, and they can be any length you want them. Uh, our uh, cancer um, uh, volunteers that uh, run the vol the wig the wig um, uh, borrowing wherever uh, however they distribute their wigs um, they actually had a couple of really long beautiful uh, long haired wings wigs and uh, had to make some of these that were 24 inches because it was really really nice long long wig and he said they don't need many but periodically if they have a really nice long wig so they 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 asked me to make two. 24 inch ones and I make most of them are between 14 and 16 some have been as low as 12 inches so yeah you can make them whatever size whatever size you need and if you're mass producing them the way that I'm doing them with the spindles it doesn't matter the length because I just put the tenons on first and just throw them in a pile and when I go to uh, put the wigs together it's whatever's in the pile goes in and that some of them are you know, longer and shorter and uh, I don't use them. So I, I don't know, but they've always been really, really well received that they do have a, an assortment of, uh, of heights. So you've been, this video here has been less than an hour and you turned a wig stand. Well, that's pretty impressive. Uh, Randy and I have been turning for about two years and uh thank you so much for showing this to us oh no you're very, yeah, very, very, welcome. very very welcome you, if i you wasn't doing so a video quickly. well if i if i wasn't doing a video uh in this hour i would have probably had three done because like i say when i when i do one step i do one step three times and my muscle memory gets you know you get used to it so i, I don't have to keep retrying the holes all the time because i, I kind of get used to it so uh, this was the first one today. So uh, the hole's a little sloppy. The next one would be a better fit on the first go. And uh, in in a matter of two hours, I'd probably have 10 of them uh, shaped out, then just ready for sanding and uh, final finishing. So it's really good for production turning if you do one step at a time. Or well, if you have really one good. person in the room, then one person can do one step and hand it to the next person. And just then that way, everybody's muscle get into the groove 
if you had two or three people doing this in the same room and everybody's doing their one little part, you could probably do uh, two dozen in a matter of an afternoon real easily. Well, Bert, we really appreciate you taking the time to go through this for um, the Seattle Wind Turners, the women in turning. This has been very helpful. Um, thank you for reaching out um, to my email that I had sent the other day. Uh, we look forward to getting this Zoom meeting uh, in my email and I'll distribute it to the ladies. And after we get them painted, we'll send you some uh, after photos. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate seeing the, the results of it. And any any comments? I mean, if you see something that I'm doing that um, you're not comfortable with, uh, by all means, tell me, because I'm only doing what works well for me, and some other people may not uh, be that comfortable with my techniques, and that's totally fine. I just, uh, just want to let everybody know I'm doing what works for me, and uh, if you can benefit from it, great. Yeah, it, it's been great watching you and you were the, of all the videos I watched on YouTube and there were, oh, at least half a dozen. Uh, yours was my favorite because it was simple steps. It was straightforward, easy for mass production. So uh, oh. really enjoyed watching your video and then seeing you here today turning this. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad you watched the video and I'm glad you enjoyed it. So they're, they're fun to make. We made that one, I think, back in the COVID days. So I was in my shop and we wanted a, a, a meeting for our club meeting. So I did a demonstration on uh, in my shop and called that the meeting demo. So that was good. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, Bert. <laughs> okay, I guess we're, okay, that's, I it. Guess we're, we're done, done. eh? That's it. We're done. <laughs>